is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? And so as we start out with that, we need to say this scripture of 107 of Psalms says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In other words, God's commissioning us that we should give thanks to him for God is good all the time. Amen? And if God's been good to us, it is to give our praise and our best for him. So I want to encourage you today that as we enter into worship, don't wait, don't judge, don't critique, join in. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. You want to see God move in a powerful way? Let God move inside of you by giving him all the thanks and all the praise. So somebody say a good amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Give the Lord a praise this morning. Amen. Let's give God the thanks for it. And then... Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask you, Lord, just to fill our hearts. Lord, there's going to be battleground. There's going to be battlefields. But God, we surrender that to you. You are the one who fights with us and for us in every way. So God, we trust that, Lord, what you're equipping for us to be, what you're working out for us, that all things work together for good. We are beginning to settle in with this faith and strength and confidence that comes from you. So God, we're going to praise you in advance because your credit is good with us. We were going to praise you before the battle's over. We're going to praise you before the sickness is finished. We're going to praise you because you're worthy of our praise. So God, we say, God, we trust you. We love you. And we are here to worship you with all of our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul. Let us, Lord, worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everybody said a good and mighty amen. 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 Let's jump in. All right, good morning, everybody. So we have a new song for you guys today, and we're going to start off with the chorus, you know, just so we can learn it. And it goes like this. So sing, Let the Redeemed. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. And pour out your faithfulness. Let it overflow, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of
And I search the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough oh, yeah. Then you, you came along
Yes, God. How many of you guys believe that God is good? Yeah. I didn't quite hear that. How many of you guys believe that God is good? Yeah. He gave us today. He gave us snow after a thousand years of no snow. <laughs> I just, I just want to really be thankful to him this morning. We're all here, and those of us that aren't here, I know you're listening out there. I hope you are. Oh, yeah. So let's just worship together for this song.
Inspiration, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. your God, your living hope, our only hope. Amen. Praise God. 
Oh, Lord, we just come before you this morning. May our eyes never cease to see your wondrous beauty, to see the miracles that are right before our eyes, and sometimes we turn away and don't even recognize. We don't even acknowledge it. I pray, oh God, that our lips would speak praises unto you always, continually, continually, as the word says. Lord, I pray our ears would be open, open and not closed to our mindset, not opening them to allow you to speak, speak a word into us that may mm, kind of be a little sandpaper to us. But God, may our eyes be open and receptive and may we be willing, Father, to hear you. We thank you, O oh God, for your faithfulness. We thank you, O oh God, for your love, for your mercy. Since your faithfulness never ends. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for this time of worship today. We give you all today, Father God. I pray for your anointing upon our speaker. I pray your anointing upon everyone, Lord, that's in this building today, Father God, and those that are out there watching online, that they would feel a tug at their hearts today and that they would hear a new word from you, God. Hear a new word from you. May we not be so set in our ways, God, that we can't allow a new thing to enter into our lives that you have planned for us, that you have a gift for us that sometimes we don't even accept. But Lord, we open our hands today. We don't close them. We open our hands today. Thank you. Thank you. And amen. Mind me stealing this mic. <laughs> Good morning, church. It is always such an honor and a blessing to worship with you guys. You guys are a great team. You know, I really love it. <laughs> All right, so I'm here to give you guys announcements. Now, you guys know I get loud, so put your earplugs in. <laughs> All right, so first on the list, home groups, locations in East and West Palmdale. So there's no excuse that it's not close to you. Yes, it is. See Pastor Mike or Miss Lita for details. All right, and men's ministry, they're going to munch in at the luncheon. March 5th at 11.45, all right? March 5th, 11.45 at Claim Jumpers. See Joseph B. for details, wherever he went. All right, and men's, men's ministry is also having a men's retreat March 17th. See PB, I don't know where he is either, <laughs> for details. And women's Bible study, Saturday, March 4th from 9 to 10 a.m. here at the church. You can see Miss Fania for details for that. All right, my favorite. My favorite kids, hello. We're going to get this right someday. Lighthouse Youth, where you at? <laughs> Friday is here, 6 p.m. at the church. If you got, guys got any youth in your family, in your neighborhood, please invite them. They have a lot of fun here. All right. Young adults in the sound booth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 6 p.m. Fridays also at Casa de Robles. Ole. All right. See you guys. Thank you, Elsie. Did I hear you say munchin at the luncheon? <laughs> what? Oh, my goodness. Gosh, that girl's got more talent than I even realized. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the offering, and I got a question for you. What is it that will make God upset, mad, angry? It's when we don't obey, all right? Now, how many have, if you have kids, you told your child something, and your child not only didn't want to do it, they just said they didn't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. That kind of makes us mad. You don't, they're supposed to mind, you know? Our kids, they're supposed to mind. Now, I don't know about you, but my dogs, they mind better than my kids. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, my, my, my dogs, I, I'll put a whoop into them. But uh, my kids, yeah, I'll spank them, but eh, not anymore. They're too old to spank. <laughs> and I, I, I don't spank my grandkids. I will not do that. But I will tell on them. <laughs> so Megan, take care of them. Angie, take care of them. <laughs> but uh, I, I will scold them and stuff like that. But 
God wants us to obey him. And he has told us in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and in offerings. Okay, I wasn't quite done with that. Thank you. <laughs> you are under, under a curse, you whole nation, because you are robbing me. Next one. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Let me read that again. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you that there will be no room enough to store it. Oh, man, he's going to throw open the storehouses of heaven. When you listen to the Lord, when you obey the Lord, and you pay your tithe, and he comes with a promise, test me in this. Come on, don't hold back from God. He wants to bless you. He wants to pour out his blessings on you. And that's all we have to do when we listen to the Lord, when we obey the Lord and we mind him. Give your tithe and offerings to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. If you're online, you can go to plaog.net and scroll down to the bottom. There's a place where you can pay your tithes there. You can do it then, and then the, for you that are here, you can pay it in the back over there on the desk. There's also a little place on the wall back there. It says tithe. You can just open up the lid right there and put it into there. There's a couple places there uh, that we can do when we're here. But online, you can do it there also. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your promises, Lord, and we ask that you would just touch each one that's here tonight or th this morning lord we ask that you would just show your glory to us show us your mercy lord help us that we can understand what you have in store for us lord and we just love you for it and we thank you for it in your name we pray amen amen why do we give we give to make a difference to touch hearts and change lives. We give to feed the hungry, care for the sick, and comfort those in need. We give to show Jesus to our neighbors, our community, and the world. We give as an act of worship to a God who has given everything. We give because we are the church, the body of Christ, called to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing the hope of the gospel. This is why we give. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Ain't it true? We, we live in a world that needs more of our giving than ever before. We have a society that needs the gift of God and the gift of the church. That when we are that church, what would a church be like that could change a culture, to change a community? It's not only filled with love, it's got to be filled with power. Come on, and we agree with that? Not only filled with God's love and power, but it's got to have joy because if it isn't attractive to pull people in. So if you're looking today and you're saying, man, I don't know how to be happy, I'm going to tell you, look up to Jesus Christ because that's where your help's coming from. And as you look at those mountains and how beautiful, come on, somebody see those beautiful mountains today? How beautiful our God is. And so that joy that fills your heart, I mean, I was praying for a whole lot of snow and I was willing to cancel service. No, I wasn't. But the idea was like, man, let's just get in and let's just have a great time because there's like a refreshing, a crispness, there's a coolness of what God has brought together. And so we need to be the givers that God has called for us to be. So look to that neighbor next to you and challenge him by saying, let's give. Tell him that. Let's give. Let's make that difference. Change, change a person that's behind you, beside you. Look at them and say, hey, you give too because I'm going to give. Amen? So let's share that always within the hope that we know 
God's love, God's joy, and well as God's power is evident, always available for our lives. Amen? Amen. Children's Church, you are dismissed. Kids, you can head back there. We have a wonderful service planned for you. Those of you who made it here, thanks for traversing through all the cold, as well as all the sunlight and all the snow that's not on the ground, but it's in the mountains, right? Yeah. So we had a blessed time of three days of rain. And have you been thanking God for all the rain we've had for this year? I mean... It is like Elijah said, you know what, I see a cloud of the size of a man's fist and it has been unleashed. And so there's the joy of serving God. Now I say all of that to just pay, make it personal for us. How many believe God still heals? How many, how many believe God still provides? I mean, how many believe that God is still changing lives? Amen. And when God is doing that within our lives, we've got to take it personal and say, if God's going to be with me, we've got to learn to keep on giving because God didn't call you to be the dead sea. He calls you to make the sea that makes the difference to give life. And so he's asking for us to let the power of, and the, ple, the uh, blessings of God and the peace of God not just flow into us, to flow out of us. And this is what we say all the time. God wants to do something in you so he can do something. It's right. So that's why we want to be a church that gives. A church that gives the joy, the church that gives the, the, the giftings of what God is able to do in our lives. And this is our vision. So you keep on reminding yourself. It's why we keep it here. We want to present God to you. We want to present the brothers and sisters in the Lord to you. And we want to present to you the opportunities that God's seated in you, the gifts of God that will continue helping you to give everywhere you go. Amen? Amen. So how many of you want to say, God is good? All the time. And all the time. Amen. And you believe that? Say amen. amen. All right. I can tell you're almost fired up. This is like the Pentecostal church I remember, all right? You get a little slow getting here, but you got here, all right? So this is the joy of getting here together, and we're thankful for that. Today, you are blessed to have one of our personal best friends, him and his wife, that are with us, Bill and Haley, that are blessed every time we get here because they are such givers. It fits so much with what we're talking about they give so much to the kingdom. They give so much in our United States. They give so much in our world. They are givers by making the effort of moving forward, by saying, let's make a difference in our culture, in our government, in our schools. And how many of you know our world needs Jesus Christ? Come on now. Come on. You believe that? So why don't you give your full attention, your support. They're no longer guests and haven't been guests for a long time. This is our family that is with us, and so we welcome Bill to come and share with us. Haley, it's wonderful that you're with us as well. Luke, their son, is with us as well. God bless you. I'm going to turn on this microphone here for you, and you have at it, and then if you want to dance, go for it, all right? God bless you. And could I have a stand? Oh, absolutely. That would be super, that. where I can put the Bible. Glad to be here, amen, if my adorable and incredible and phenomenal wife would stand. And of course, I, I can't help it. Okay, we, wonderful Leah and wonderful Luke. I know people know you, but. Amen, thank you, dear sir. Maybe teeny bit higher. Amen. And let's give the clap offering to the one who really deserves it, to Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And let's go before the Lord in prayer. And let's believe him to touch as only he can and that he is going to get all of the glory. Hallelujah. Lord, we are so excited to be in your presence. And we pray, Lord God, that today you will just move in a mighty way. God, you will just touch hearts as only you can, Lord God. That you will just flow through this church, Lord God. Continue to flow as you have through the worship. And Lord, touch us where we need to be touched. And Lord, we pray that you will hide your servant behind the cross. That all might see Jesus and Jesus alone. And Lord, we just pray this with one goal in mind. That the name of Jesus might be uplifted above every other name. And it's in that name we pray, amen and amen. amen. Well, gonna, amen. Let's give the Lord.
Going to update you just a little bit about uh, what the Lord has been doing in ministry because you folks have been so faithful to pray for us. And uh, the bottom line is if you were to take um, all our talents, meaning my adorable wife and yours truly, um, and put them together, uh, they would not, if you were to multiply them by 10 times, they wouldn't even fill half of a thimble, okay? But we rely on someone other than ourselves, amen? And we know that if it wasn't for faithful people praying like you, all that we do, it just wouldn't happen. And God is on the move, and uh, we've sensed for the last two years, really, revival uh, in the country, and now it's becoming more manifest. But since we're in different churches every week, uh, wow, God has been doing wonderful things. We're so thankful. Thank you. Uh, pray for the mission trips uh, we have coming up, and uh, God has been moving a lot uh, overseas, and um, he's moving a lot in the United States of America. The, the hunger is tremendous. Prayer lines are longer than ever before. Last Sunday, we preached a couple of, ch a couple of services Sunday morning and three and a quarter hours of prayer lines. And uh, people are hungry uh, just within the last few weeks. The blind have seen, the deaf have thrown away their hearing aids, people at a, wheel, a wheelchair. We are excited because God is able. Amen? And I uh, do want to share a little bit about uh, government ministry. Thank you so much for those of you who prayed for us with the cases going before the U.S. Supreme Court that I asked you to pray about uh, last time because three of them uh, definitely uh, inf influence our, our Christian values. Two of them on abortion uh, and um, pro-life. Pro and uh, those cases out of uh, Mississippi and Texas. And of course, God won those two. And uh, that was wonderful. I really believe, now I can't prove it scripturally, but our dear brother was referring to the rains. And I believe, you know, just as you were referring to uh, Elijah, I really believe that there's a relationship, and I, this is biblical, between God's blessings and whether as a country we're following the Lord. <clears throat> and I do not think it is an accident that, I mean, <laughs> we've heard the word drought so much in California for so many years. And let's face it, this state was not designed to have so many people. I mean, a lot of our state is desert. So we need the grace of God, okay? And um, that's the only way we are going to make it. I wish more people in our leadership in politics would realize that. But I don't think it's an accident that um, the rains have come really in greater ways than I've ever seen in all the years that I've been living in California. And it really started within just a few months after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And we're talking about babies' lives, okay? And I can't say for sure whether they're related. We'll find out when we go to glory. But as I read scripture, I think there's a great possibility that the two are related. And uh, there are many things I could share with you about um, Things lining up, for example, Bible and prayer taken out of the schools in 62 and 1963. And shortly after that, our president, John F. Kennedy, because a lot of people were saying to him, fight it. It can be overturned by Congress. But God bless him. And look, um, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned this from the pulpit, but my mom was a model and uh, she dated JFK once or twice, okay, before he was married. <laughs> Just want to point that out. 
And the funny thing is, someone set her up with, uh, he, he was not president at that point, and um, uh, the person who set them up said, you ought to go out with this guy, one day he's gonna be president of the United States. Pretty wild. So I adored him growing up, so this is not to knock JFK, but interesting <coughs> that Kennedy stated that. He said, I'm not going to fight what the Supreme Court did. He refused and got a lot of people in Congress upset. He just said, Play, pray more at home. A few months later, he was assassinated. Okay. Uh, when Roe v. Wade was passed, a few months later, we had the OPEC oil embargo. Remember those, for those of you who have a few gray hairs on your head, remember the lines for gas? That OPEC oil embargo was just a few months after Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court in 1973. Now, I can't prove these things are related, but I'm going to be asking the Lord in glory. I'll tell you that much, okay? And so I believe uh, it's very, very possible that these reigns of blessing may be related to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Again, I can't prove it, but you look at the Word of God, and I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, so let it rain, spiritually and physically, let it rain. But anyway, yours truly was asked to do the statistical analysis uh, for the two Supreme Court cases, and then there was also a school choice case uh, in which uh, I wrote an amicus brief along with a colleague, and praise God, they all went in the right way. Uh, three victories for God's team, zero defeats. And... Uh, School choice is huge because uh, Christian schools ever since the decision have been skyrocketing in enrollment. In fact, uh, I get calls from schools saying, Christian schools saying, so many people are coming to our schools in the last few months, we can't hire enough teachers. <coughs> um, they're even, uh, I also get calls, we're, we've run out of space at our Christian schools. Do you know where we can find more space? And a lot of politicians are saying, and I quote, this solves the culture wars. Now, I'm not saying I agree with them, but what I am saying is Christian schools now are surging Public school enrollment actually is going down, believe it or not. Even though our population is increasing, that is the extent of what God is doing. And um, now, one of the neat things that happened as a result of that decision is that various governors decided, okay, this clears the way for more Christian schools. <coughs> And uh, so the first state, and by the way, do not move to Arizona as a result of what I'm about to share. This is a wonderful church, amen? amen. It is a lighthouse. Yes. 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 But you should be aware of a phenomenal victory in Arizona. God bless former Governor Ducey. Before his term ended, he decided to pass school choice. And uh, what passed in Arizona is the first state in U.S. history to make school choice available to every student in Arizona, 1.1 million people. And what it means in Arizona is if you homeschool or if you want to send your child to Christian school, the state of Arizona will pay you up to $10,000 a year to cover all tuition and materials. Now, you heard what I said, do not move to Arizona. This is the place to be, okay? This is a phenomenal church, okay? But, praise God, and uh, Iowa 
became this year the second state to do that, to make it available to all students, all students in the state of Iowa. And guess what? Basically, what, I, what yours truly is doing, what your servant is doing, is I am going from governor to governor uh, throughout many states in the United States and uh, governors who I think could be open and asking them to do the same so that the Arizona bill will become the model for the country. So pray for me in that effort. It is a spiritual battle like what you wouldn't believe when whether we're on the mission field and having rifles put on my head, ready to pull the trigger or what have you. Uh, what we do is not easy by any means, and we need a lot of covering in prayer. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we've gone to states like uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma looks to become the third state to pass this, and so we're working with Oklahoma. We are working, uh, trying to convince uh, Christy Noem, the governor of uh, South Dakota, and she's the real deal, by the way. I don't know if you know, but she's full gospel, okay? And she, her, pa her father is, uh, was a pastor, now he's retired, uh, and she used to run the, uh, she was in charge of the youth, for that church so she's the real deal and uh, also with Alabama um, with uh, Virginia several other states um, we're trying to convince Texas you name it Florida and uh, so pray for that effort because uh, it is potentially a game changer for this country just like the other decisions regarding uh, pro-life, so continue to pray for us. Uh, in fact, it relates to the message. So, Lord, bless your already blessed word to our hearts, Lord God, and hide your servant behind the cross that all might see Jesus and Jesus alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You know, it's interesting because, let's face it, we live in a crazy world. It seems that our leaders have gone crazy, and it's not only in the United States, it's all around the world. And it's easy to get discouraged. And I've seen a lot of Christians come up to me and say, oh, this is terrible. We need to go back to the first century church. And guess what? In so many ways, we do need to go back to the first century church. That's our example in many respects in the book of Acts and so forth. But we need to remember that the world was crazy back then as well. But God won anyway. And we need to remember that and be encouraged that in this crazy world in which we live, Praise God, God is going to win anyway. Amen? Let's turn together to the book of Acts. We're going to read a few passages in the book of Acts. The first one is in Acts chapter 5. And the title of this morning's message is Beyond the First Century Church. Acts chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in verse 12, and again, we'll be reading other portions of Acts as well. The first point we want to make is in Acts chapter 5, and the first point we want to make is powerfully anointed, but opposed by the jealous. So Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. The apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. 
As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. So powerfully anointed, but opposed by the jealous. Now, you see all these signs and wonders, and we need to realize, if we're going to see revival, we really need to be flowing in the power of the Spirit. And notice verse 15. It says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Wow. Such an anointing that even Peter's shadow was sufficient so that people were being touched. But also notice what happens in verse 18. It says they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And notice why they put them in, in jail. Verse 17, then the high priest and his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Now, we've probably heard from Scripture of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the legalistic conservatives. And I'm speaking religious, religiously, not, you know, so much politically, not politically, but religiously. The Pharisees were legalistic conservatives. They believed that you know, on the Sabbath, you could only do this, this, and this, and this is how many steps you could walk, and all of this sort of thing. But here, we're talking about the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were the religious liberals. Now, again, we're not going into politics. I don't believe in doing that from the pulpit. But they were religious liberals in the sense that they did not believe in the resurrection. And you might remember that uh, the Apostle Paul addressed that issue when he had to deal with both the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the same time. So, here the Apostles were being used mightily, and it states that there were members of the party of the Sadducees, so in other words, those who did not believe in the resurrection, and they were filled with jealousy. You know, it's interesting. Proverbs 27, 4 says, Wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? You know, when people are jealous, wow, are they capable of some awful things. And I'm sure we've run into that. We've run into people that were jealous and just did things that we thought no human being would do. And jealousy, I think, uh, the enemy can use jealousy and can make people do things they normally wouldn't do. And here you see, all they're doing, all the apostles are doing is seeing people helped and healed 
And on that basis, they are thrown into jail. In fact, there's another verse in, uh, in Romans 12. It states that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And I think uh, that is one of the best definitions in Scripture of what it means to be a true friend. True friends rejoice when we rejoice and weep when we weep. Now, a lot of people, even <laughs> some we might call friends, they do neither, okay? They don't really rejoice that much when we rejoice, and they don't weep that much when we weep. There are people like that. And then you found a better friend if, in fact, you know someone who does one or the other, but not both. There are a lot of people who rejoice when we rejoice, but then when we're going through it, oh, uh, that's nice to talk to you. I'll talk to you later. Okay, when we're going through it, they just don't want to hear it. They only want to hear happy, 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 and that's it. And then there are other people who will weep when we weep, but if we've got wonderful news like, I'm engaged, or I've got the big promotion, or something like that. They'll go, oh, that's nice. And then we think, what is going on there? One of the biggest events of my life, and you're not rejoicing with me? It is special indeed, then, when we find a friend who does both, who rejoices when we rejoice and weeps when we weep, and that is indeed special. And if we've got people who are jealous of us, it's discouraging, but praise God, God is bigger. Amen? Amen. So yes, we've got a lot of people in the world who are nutty and so forth, but God is bigger than the jealousy. God did miracles anyway, even to the point where Peter just walked by many times and the shadow of Peter was used of God and people were healed. Amen? Amen. Second point is we need to be full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now for this, we turn to Acts chapter 6. And we begin reading in verse 5. And this is uh, right after the choosing of Stephen and the deacons to wait on the table so that those who ministered the gospel would have time to pray and also preach the word. So that's what was said in verse 4 and before. So we pick up in verse 5. This proposal... Please, the whole group, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now here's where we really want to look closely. Verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Isn't that ironic? You know, they claim to have freedom, they don't. As it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia 
and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. Verse 10 and 11, we're especially going to emphasize. Verse 10, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Now, here it was, again, a crazy time. God was using Stephen. People were being healed. There were signs and wonders. How can you oppose that? Leave it to the world. Okay, leave it to the world. But notice, God was bigger. It says in verse 10, but they could not stand up against, and notice, it doesn't say the wisdom of Stephen. Uh Uh-uh, doesn't say that. It says they could not stand against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as they spoke. Now, this should really encourage us. We can be up against people who are so vicious and opposing all that is good, but God can still win the day. I remember, in fact, because uh, given that I do a lot of work with government, I sometimes get invited either by the government or what have you to engage in debates. And of course, I stand for the Lord and they'll have some person who opposes the Lord in some way and that's the person I'm debating. So some years ago, I was invited by former members of the Clinton administration to a debate. And I was to present the side of how we've paid a huge price from taking Bible and prayer out of the public schools, that we've never been the same as a, as a country since, and that we need to allow the Bible as literature, we need to allow students to pray and have a moment of silence, And we need character education. And I was debating someone, a professor, a Harvard professor, who was far brighter than me. In fact, he's famous. You have probably, either in high school or college, you've probably read some of his excerpts from his works or his books. And uh, his name is Howard Gardner. He is the one who came up with the theory of multiple intelligences. And he is one of uh, Harvard's foremost professors. Brilliant man. And I was to debate him. Ha, ha, ha. God has a sense of humor. It seemed like I would get annihilated because I was up against one of the more brilliant professors in the country. And you know what? Had it just been him against me, I wouldn't have stood a chance in the world. And you may feel in a similar situation that you're encountering now that you are up against a situation that is far Bigger than any of us here. But you see, as Christians, we have an advantage, don't we? We may not be especially bright. I was not particularly bright, am not particularly bright. I knew he was eons beyond me. But because I'm a Christian, I had a certain advantage that he didn't. And that is, all of us have this advantage as Christians. We are hooked up to God who knows it all. Amen? So we were having this debate, and a lot, this was not an ordinary debate. There were a lot of famous people in the audience, so it was very important for God to prevail. 
lot of politicians who are household names, Pulitzer Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners, someone who invented many of the apps on your iPhone, etc. And during the debate, I said to the Lord, in my mind, I said, Lord, it's going to have to be you. It sure can't be me. And I remembered back to many verses in Scripture, several verses in Scripture, where Jesus just says the absolutely right words and the debate is over. That the opposition had nothing to say. No one could say anything in opposition. And some verses will say something like, he taught with authority, not like with one of the scribes. Or it'll say, and they were all put to si they were all silenced, having nothing to say in opposition. And I thought of those verses, I said, God, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I need a sentence that will end this debate right then and there. I don't know what the sentence is, but I'm hooked up with you as your child, and you know what that sentence is. Lord, please give me that sentence that will end the debate. So anyway, <clears throat> I said, you know, I kind of repeated my theme, that we've paid a huge price for taking Bible and prayer out of the schools and character education. And then Howard Gardner kind of gave the standard argument given for why we shouldn't have these activities in the public schools. And he said, well, but whose values do we teach? I'm sure you've heard that argument before. And that is when I said, God, give me the sentence. I'm totally dependent on you, Lord. Without you, I don't stand a chance. Lord, give me that sentence that will end the debate. And by God's grace alone, and maybe some of your prayers too. He did. And I, and by the way, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Gardner was very nice to me, very respectful. And when I have debates, whether it be against the ACLU's main attorney or whatever, I believe in being loving, kind, and respectful because I don't want to win the battle and lose the war. So when he said that, I said that is a valid point. However, we have paid a much greater price for taking Bible and prayer out of the schools than we ever would by having that debate. And Howard Gardner responded, you're right. And right then and there, those were the last words uttered. Those were the last words uttered, and the debate was over about eight minutes before it was supposed to end. And I had, I mean, I felt like it was the Super Bowl. Because I was mobbed by all these prize winners by all these CEOs, politicians who agreed with me, COOs, God had won the day. And we need to be reminded, every single one of us here, we need to be reminded of the access every single one of us as a child of God we have to the Lord because sure, we're not up to the task, but he is. Amen? Amen? 
Now then we see in verse 11, it says, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Now notice, it says, they secretly persuaded some men to say. In other words, they encouraged and persuaded other people to bear false witness, to lie. Now, it's tough when you're up against lies. How do you defend yourself against lies? You know, if we're debating about truth, at least we're on the same page. But how do you debate with someone or defend yourself when that other person is lying? It's hard. But God is able, amen? amen? With all due respect to Hindus, let me say the following. This is one issue I have with the religion of Hinduism. Because if you're going through a trial, what the Hindus will say, if you say, wow, I mean, I'm following God the best I can. I'm far from perfect, but trying to follow God, Hindus will say, well, it must be something you did in your past life. (laughs) And of course, that's not biblical. Reincarnation is not biblical. But in addition to all that, how do you defend yourself against someone who is claiming you've had a past life? You know, you can't defend yourself because you didn't have a past life. In fact, I'll, I'll tease with all respect, but to make a point, the folly of reincarnation another way, that it's not biblical, not even logical. Because imagine yourself, let's just say that there's a big fly flying around. And you know, they're some of the most annoying because they make so much noise. You know, sometimes you look at a fly and you think, how could something so small make so much noise? You know, you can walk into a room and there's a fly maybe in another room and you'll hear it, that little thing. So you decide, I got to swat this fly because this fly is making so much noise. So imagine this, here you are going after this really big fly and you swing and miss And then you get closer and suddenly you stop. A person stops who believes in reincarnation. Not you, but someone who believes in reincarnation. And they look at the fly and suddenly they say, Grandpa? Grandpa? Is that you? I mean, it really is ridiculous if you think about it. That's what it comes down to if you believe in reincarnation. So defending ourselves against lying is tough, and there's a lot of lying out there. But God is bigger. Amen? Amen. Last point. And I'll warn you, this is uh, one where it may, the Word of God may step on some toes. Victory, even in the worst of circumstances, our third and final point, We turn to Acts chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 12, and this is quite the passage. Verse 12, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. 
This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting them, him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That night, before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Wow. Now, one challenge in the book of Acts, as opposed to, say, the letters of Paul, Peter, John, etc., is it's largely a narrative. Okay, it's, you know, a lot of, like, you read Ephesians, it's teaching, Philippians, teaching. And usually, it's very easy to do if you're reading a narrative, like the book of Acts. It's very easy to read through it quicker than you would, say, the book of Ephesians or Philippians. And yet, we mustn't miss the first two and a half verses with this in mind because this is really one of the darkest two and a half verses in the New Testament. Because notice, Herod in verse 1 arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. So one of the old disciples, now apostle, he's dead. He's gone. And you remember, 12 disciples, but there were three that Jesus especially communicated with and fellowship with, Peter, James, and John. One of those three was now dead. Then verse 3, when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And we are told, verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial. So his intention was to bring Peter before trial. And I think we can figure out if he did what he did with James, what his intentions were with Peter. I mean, this is dark. We're talking about two of the top, the leading disciples that Jesus used that he ministered to especially. And one was already gone, dead. And now there was another, Peter, and he was more than likely about to be gone as well. Whew. It doesn't get much darker than this. And again, I think we can, you know, as we go through the book of Acts, because it is a narrative, it's so easy to miss how dark these two and a half verses are. But, verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. And that made all the difference, didn't it? Verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping before two soldiers, were even told before in, in verse 4, there were four squads of four soldiers each. Sixteen! 
guarding him. Can you imagine? And yet, even in the midst of this seeming impossibility, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and, sa- and freed him and said, Quick, get up. Now, maybe today, I hope not, but maybe there are some of us here who are in a situation that is extremely severe, just like Peter. And we think there's no way out. We can't do it. But praise God, with prayer and with God's grace, he can do it. Amen? Amen? No matter how bad it is. And again, this is about as dark as it gets in the book of Acts and after the Gospels and so forth. But even then, God was able to do it. And if God could do it then, praise God, no matter what our situation is today, God can do it again. Amen? Now, here's where I want to warn you. May step on some toes. So if you have a harder shoe, by the way, this is the time you want to put it on. I'm not making any uh, statements about the shoes you wear. I'm, I'm funning around with you. But this may step on some toes. I'm sure we've heard of some great moves of God, not just at Asbury. You know, Asbury's gotten a lot of the publicity, but <coughs> there, there's uh, other universities, in, uh, and some of them secular, some of them Christian. There's a Christian university in Ohio. Same thing, 3,000 people at a service, and it's just going on. Lee University in Tennessee, and by the way, I do not think it is any accident that where the revivals are hitting the greatest, Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, even goes up to Maine, by the way. You wouldn't expect that, but it does. But where the revivals are the most intense, that is where we have the highest per capita number of students who have taken the Bible as literature as a one to two year course, six units for a year, 12 units for two years in the public school. Because now over 2.4 million public school students have taken this course. 3.3 3.3 million, if you include other countries. And in fact, there are many missionaries. We've met some of them. They go to places like India and Australia, and their only assignment is to teach the Bible in the schools, the Bible's literature in the schools. And the revival spreading to many secular universities. University of Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky University. Most recently, Texas A&M. Right outside of Kyle Field, which is the main football stadium, uh, they're in revival and uh, they've just been going 24 hours a day worshiping the Lord. But we might ask, and here's where careful of your toes, we might ask, why is it that the revival is among young adults? Okay, it's among people, say, 18 to 25 for the most part. 18 to 30. There are some people who are now included in that. That's no accident that I said that, by the way. So why is it overwhelmingly among young people? I mean, it's undeniable when you go there. 
And I think one of the reasons likely is too many Christians who are older are spending too much time whining. Now look, I get it. I'm in that older group. And I think for those of us who have seen this country when it was much more of a God-fearing country, when Bible and prayer were in the schools. For me, I mean, I, I'm from New York originally. We prayed during the Cuban Missile Crisis for God's protection, and here's the wild thing. As I was raised in an atheistic home, didn't receive the Lord till I was a senior in high school, and I never had more peace in my non-Christian life than when we prayed during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Go figure. Because when you're raised in New York, you know, along with people in Washington, D.C., you're likely to be among the first two targets. You just grew up knowing that. When I was uh, even in kindergarten in school, we had to fill out a form every year, even though we were young. The address of our school, we had to know it by heart. The address of our home, we had to know it by heart and be able to write it. And the address of the closest bomb shelter. That's what it was to be raised in New York. And it's hard, I think, for many of us who have a few miles that we have walked in this life to see where the U.S. used to be in terms of Christianity and where it is now. And so it's very easy to whine. But I believe one of the major reasons why God is using the youth, young adults, they're not whining. <laughs> so let's stop whining and participate in the move of God. Yeah. Amen? Let us pray. Hallelujah. <clears throat> With all heads bowed and eyes closed, I ask this question. Those amongst us today who would say, Lord, I really do want to live for you. I really do want to participate in this revival. But Lord, I look at my life and I'm really not sure where I stand before you. I'm really not sure if you were to come back for your church this very day. If I go and live and be with you forever and ever, I'm really not sure. The neat thing is that's okay as long as we decide to do something about it. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, those of us who would say, Lord, I'm really not sure where I stand before you today, but I want to be sure just put up your hands before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Quite a number of hands. You may put your hands down. For the benefit of these who have raised their hands, let's all of us repeat this prayer aloud together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I know you love me. I know you've died on the cross for me to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn away from my sins and follow you with all my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me a new life of love, of joy, and of peace. I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. 
Thank you for hearing my prayer. And coming to live inside of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. And quite a number of you raised your hands, and I encourage you, either as the pastor or myself or um, Eunice or my uh, adorable wife, Haley, or the other leaders of the church, so we can encourage you in the faith. But I have a second question. And it's simply this. Those amongst us today would say, yes, Lord, I want to go beyond the first century church. I don't want to whine. I want to be a participant in what you're doing today in the same way the apostles were in the first century church. And if that's your prayer today, and I sure know it's mine. Just stand right where you are before the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask, uh, we are going to pray for people for healing and other things. Um, but I'm going to ask Pastor to just kind of direct us in that and uh, dismiss some who want to go and others who want to stay. For those who want prayer, I'm going to ask you to come here to the front and to the altars. And for those of you uh, that are going to be dismissed, uh, just know that we have some time for fellowship for you out there as well uh, to serve you and to gather our fellowship and friends. But keep in mind at any point in time, let's be lenient to what the Holy Spirit is wanting for us to lean into today. How many believe God's here to stay? How many believe God's speaking to us through his Holy Spirit right now? And so let's be obedient to how the Spirit directs us. Don't let thoughts in the mind of fear or what people think or any of those things get in the way of God. Let God speak to us. So if you need prayer, just go ahead and start making your way right here. Make your way now, even as I'm talking, and then we're going to say a prayer. As you are walking, we're going to pray and dismiss, okay? So let's go. Father, we just thank you, God, for the word that challenges us, the word that equips us, and the word that changes us. And so, Lord, we pray that that change will take fruit within our lives that will be manifested, Lord, that because we come to pray, there comes the power. Because we come to seek you, we find the significance of what you've placed us in in our world today. We, Lord, know that you're calling us. And so, God, we want to answer with our obedience and say, here, Lord, here am I. Send me. So, Father, as you do your work in our healing, as you do our, your work in us, as your power, as you do the work in us in change and transformation, we thank you for what we are here to do, to seek you and to follow your leadership. Bless us now with this word. Bless us now with this power. And bless us now with this truth that when we leave this room, when we leave this building, that, God, we're taking you with us and we're never going to be the same because, Lord, we're seeking you. We're seeking your filling, your power, your anointing, your liberty. We're seeking you, Father. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift, and we believe this in Jesus' name. And everybody said a powerful amen. amen. Come in. I said a powerful Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come up here for prayer and the rest of you dismissed and fellowship well. God bless you.